uh, 45 minutes here. And let's uh, let's talk. Thank you. Yes, could you tell me how I could get um, paid 100,000 a year plus benefits when I've already been convicted of voter fraud? Yeah. No, okay. So this is, you know, a concern. Yeah. You've no. already been convicted. I could see due process. And, you know, I understand. So let me, let me let me distinguish the three situations. All right. So um, with regard to Senators E and Calderon, I've been very clear. It is my fervent desire that they leave. Um, I've called for their resignations. And I um, would love nothing more, thank you, I would love nothing more than to expel them from their offices. I feel constrained from doing so because of that American notion of due process, innocent illness until proven guilty. With regard to Rod Wright, the situation is different. Um, he has been charged and yes found guilty by a jury of his peers for living outside of his residence, outside of his district when he applied. Senator Wright's situation is similar to four other members in the legislature whose DA district attorneys chose not to bring charges against them. Senator Wright was found guilty by his uh, by a jury, but the judge has purposely intentionally not entered the verdict of guilty into the record because she has decided that she wants to review the jury's verdict over a short period of time and is scheduled to do so on or about May the 15th. My belief and feeling and opinion, controversial as it is, and I understand you and others disagree, is that to Expel him from the Senate now would be irreversible. He has two and a half years left on his on his term. Would be irreversible. And that if the judge sets aside the verdict because of the ambiguity under the law about the rules relating to residency, you know, in Congress, you don't have to live in your district in order to run. If the judge sets it aside, he comes back to the Senate. If the judge upholds the verdict, again, in a month, a month and a half, then I've been very clear that he is out of the Senate, expelled, or he has to resign again a full two plus years before the end of his term. Let me make another, another point if I might. It would be to our, hey, how are you? It would be to our political advantage as Democrats to expel him immediately. Because to expel him immediately would mean that his seat would be filled by another Democrat, and we would increase our majorities. And so I'm trying to balance, uh, I'm trying to be fair. And to me, to expel him before the judges had that narrow window to review the jury's verdict would be irreversible and, and could not be taken, taken away. If the verdict is entered as guilty by the judge, he's out. Senator, uh, there's another American notion, though. Uh, Derek, we've got a candidate for Secretary of State here, so <laughs> if he wants to come to my event and campaign, he's welcome. No, I'm a constituent. I live five blocks away. I'm talking Go ahead. To the constituent. You're, welcome. You're welcome. There's another notion of no taxation without representation. Correct. We have three million people who are not being represented right now. We all, as your constituents, know you're one of the most honest guys in the Senate. I don't think anyone is questioning that. But I, I'm wondering if you would consider if you and your colleagues might be too close to the situation and whether we should look to something like Congressman setting up an independent ethics agency after the Abramoff scandals to let an outside entity, maybe a former legislator, but with subpoena power, people who aren't their colleagues and have a little bit more distance deal with this type of thing in the future. What do you think about it? I think it may not be a bad idea, and it's something that, uh, Eric, that I'd like to consider. Look, one of the things that I have said, let me talk about the three situations in general, because I am of two minds in one sense. On the one hand, if you look at Ian Calderon and how gross the allegations are, how gross they are, these are anomalies, because I say 
that there is no ethics class I have ever seen that teaches about the illegality of smuggling illegal guns, right? I mean, it sort of speaks for itself. On the other hand, when you have three members who have been, wait, 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 when you have three members who have been uh, indicted, two for most the most serious of charges. You have an obligation as a leader and as any elected official to take a look inside and to ask the question, okay, what are we doing? Or what, what more could we be doing? What more could we be doing to improve, improve behavior, to improve the ethical practices? Yes, so, it appears that you're presiding over the most corrupt legislature in California history. How does that make you feel? Well, I, you know, I, I sure appreciate the question. Thank you. <laughs> well, this is actually is not the first time that this is uh, that this has occurred in the legislature. In the in the uh, in the late '80s, there were I think more uh, folks. Uh, who, who came into came into this kind of trouble? But look at I. I um, how do I feel about it? I feel terrible about it. I feel um, even though I didn't do it, and I conduct myself ethically as the leader of the place, I feel responsible. You're darn right, I do. I'm, I'm having a hard time sleeping at night, and also trying to figure out what I can do better what I can do to reinforce uh, the, the ethics that the vast majority of my colleagues live by. Um, to try to turn this sickening and troubling episode into something positive. You know, for days I said, after, you know, there have been different chapters of this, but I've consistently said, judge us on our work. And that the irony of the, this situation is I honestly believe that under my leadership, this has been uh, among the most productive eras in recent California history. And I, I'm proud. I won a Profile and Courage Award at the John F. Kennedy Library for helping, lead the, for helping lead the state through the worst recession and budget in modern history. But you know what? Truth be told, with, it's all on film. It's, it's kind of beside the point. It's like, that's not enough. It's not enough. Because even though I know that these two, call it two and a half, because I tried to distinguish the right situation, you know, are an anomaly, that's beside the point, too. It's like, we have an obligation to look inside and to, and to ask ourselves, can we be doing these jobs better? And can we improve the ethics of, of the institution? That's what I intend to do. So how do I feel about it? Terrible. But I intend to stay strong, and I intend to try to make it better.
um, to, to make a uniform action at one time. That's what I decided. Because I thought that was what, what was necessary uh, under the circumstances. And there's a common element to the common action line. Neither one of them, or none of the three of them, now have a vote in the California State Senate. Okay. To the detriment, again, not that I'm looking for any pity here, to the detriment of my political party and our, quote, supermajority. Yes, 